Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Job. Uh, we'll study chapter 38 tonight. If you have not seen the previous studies, I, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Particularly chapters 1 and 2 lay the groundwork so that you can understand the remainder of the book of Job uh, correctly. So, uh, but before we get started, uh, I have uh, Brother Evan and Brother Stephen here with me tonight. So, let me ask each of you to just introduce yourselves. Hey, everybody! Once again, Stephen here, known as Stephen Rivers TV on YouTube. As per usual, looking forward to another night of studying, you know, fellowship, and sharing the gospel in about 50 minutes. Uh, my name is Evan. I go by Nephilim Free on YouTube. I do Christian apologetics. I'm a young earth creationist Christian, and I'm blessed to be here with my brothers studying God's beautiful word. Okay. Uh, let me just say that if uh, um, anybody is not familiar with uh, uh, Brother Evan's uh, YouTube channel, all of his works uh, on YouTube, I, I hope you will subscribe to his channels, uh, Nephilim Free, and also Evan Phillips. Uh, he's, um, he's, he's the best I've ever seen, um, bar none, at de defending uh, creationism, young, young earth, uh, arguing against atheism and Calvinism. So you, you'll be blessed if you, uh, if you follow what he does. Uh, Brother, Brother Stephen is just starting off doing his videos, so I hope you'll subscribe to both of them and, and support them. Okay, um, I'm going to read it, the chapter 38 in its entirety uh, through in the KJV, and then we're going to go back and go verse by verse, and we'll, we'll look at it in the Amplified to get an amplification of the verse, and uh, then I'll be relying on uh, these two brothers to, to explain it to me. All right, so here we go. Uh, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up, the, up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling band for it and break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors and said hitherto shalt thou come but no further and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place that it might take hold of the ends of the earth? that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. And from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth, Declare, if thou knowest it all, where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? That thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, and that thou shouldest know the path to the house thereof? Knowest thou it, that, that thou wast, uh, because thou wast then born, or because the number of thy days is great? Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hill, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? 
By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth, where no man is, on the wilderness, wherein there is no man, to satisfy the desolate and waste ground? And, and waste ground, and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth? Hath the rain a father? Or who hath begotten the drops of dew? Out of, those, uh, out of whose womb came the ice? And the hoary frost of heaven, who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Acturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinance of heaven? Canst thou set the dom dominion thereof in the earth? Canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds, that abundance of waters may cover thee? Canst thou send lightnings? that they may go and say in, unto thee, Here we are? Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts? Who hath given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds in wisdom? Or who can stay the bottles of heaven when the dust groweth into hardness and the clods cleave fast together? Wilt thou hunt the prey of the lion or fill the appetite of the young lions? when they couch in their dens and abide in the covert to lie in wait? Who provideth for the raven his food when his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat? All right, so Brother Joe Byron called me a KJV firstist because uh, I'm no longer KJV onlyist, uh, but I do want to look at the KJV first. And then I think that it can be helpful to look at other translations and commentaries and also inquire of the brethren so they can help me understand these, these uh, scriptures. Uh, but I wanted to read it all in context uh, to, to get an overview. Let me ask first uh, to a very, very brief just reaction to the chapter as a whole and then we're going to go through it verse by verse but let me start with brother Stephen first to get a brief reaction to that well that was pretty you know loaded here looking at you know this coming out of nowhere I know it has a caption you know at the top of my Bible saying like this section it looks to be titled you know God you know answers Job which you know it explicitly does you know at the start of this thing but there's a lot of stuff here. What's your comment on this, uh, Brother Evan? Well, God is obviously uh, uh, humiliating Job in his righteousness. Uh, he is showing Job that Job is ignorant, you know, uh, that he doesn't know all these things that he knows. Now, God loves Job, of course. He's, he's, he's not doing this because he... He's angry at, at, at Job or, or hates Job or anything. Uh, he, he's, he's helping Job to get his mind right by giving him some perspective. And what I find so interesting about the book of Job is that God is asking Job all of these questions that relate to science. Can, Job, do you know this? Do you know that? Do you know the other? Because I know all these things. You know, I'm the one who made it. And I know everything about how it operates. Every single thing about how it operates. Can you tell me, Job? Oh, you can't tell me, can you, Job? You don't know, do you, Job? So that's kind of what it is. But what, what I find so fascinating about it is that there's so much science in these statements in, in here, these questions that God asks Job. And the interesting thing to me is about it is that when we look at the earth, we find the features of the earth explained or, or described exactly as God describes them here. And uh, and it's a, it's a very powerful refutation to the secular views on the formation of the earth and, and many other things. Well, I look forward to uh, going through it slowly and getting your feedback on, on all the science in, in this. I, I had a conversation with my phone my son today on the phone and uh, 
we were talking about Job, and my son said something kind of tongue in cheek, but it was it was an interesting thought. He says, "In Job, you 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 learn that you don't want to be far away from God, or you'll be in trouble. But if if you're too close to God, you can get in trouble too. In this case, because Job was the most righteous man in the world, I assume, because uh, in the first chapter." Uh, Satan says he's searched over the entire world and he can't find one good man that love, loves God and that uh, uh, and God's out of everybody in the whole world that God could have selected the one person he selected as the best example of mankind was Job and then of course there's a chapter in the middle of the whole book I can't remember what number it was but Job really defended himself against all these accusations and he uh, he laid out his life, the things he's done, and and uh, I, I was un, I was so impressed, and I believe that all of Job's claims about his righteousness were true, that he'd done so many good things, and he even had just good thoughts. So I'm convinced that uh, you know Job's, Job's claim of being innocent were true, and that and God of course selected him because he was the best example he could give. Satan of someone who truly was righteous and truly loved him and would not curse him simply because all of his blessings were taken away. So that's the thought that we keep in mind as we go through the entire entire book. But considering all the sufferings of Job, uh, that his his family was killed, his health was destroyed, his property and wealth was destroyed, and then he has three friends come and accuse him of being wicked, and and it goes on and on their accusations and blaming him, and say you deserve what you're getting, and then finally I think it was Elihu, there's the the fourth one, the young man that came in and said, on on top of everything else, Job, you're guilty of of um, blaming God, and saying God is um, of saying God is unjust. Because you profess that you're completely innocent, but God's punishing you. So therefore, you must think God is being unjust. But we know that it wasn't God punishing Job at all. It was satanic attack against him, uh, and God allowed it. But uh, So considering everything that's happened to Job, is there any um, anyone who would uh, be surprised that eventually even the most righteous man in the world would be so beaten down from from all the bad things that happened to him and then all of the accusations against him and he's he's just so beaten down that he hasn't cursed God but he's questioning why is this happening to me because I'm innocent I don't deserve this and now finally in chapter 38 we get God's input so uh, I'm anxious uh, to hear your your detailed uh, explanation of this. Let me read it like a verse or two at a time here in the Amplified, and then I'll ask you to respond. Now, the Amplified translation does title the chapters. Of course, we know that titles are inserted by publishers and commentators and translators. The title is not part of Scripture, but the title they gave this was God Speaks Now to Job. So, uh, obviously, it's been all this time and finally God decides to tell Job uh, a thing or two here so it says then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said quote who is this that darkens counsel questioning my authority and wisdom by words without knowledge now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me uh, so let me get your reaction to this initial statement of uh, God to Job. All right, I'll keep mine brief because I know Evan's going to have a lot to say, but that's a um, that's definitely a very powerful statement. You know, just really, you know, kind of like a really, you know, humble question. You know, by you know, looking, you know, at this, you know, and challenging him to gird himself up. You know, and to you know, ask an answer. Um, so far, it's a really powerful start. Let's hear you know, Brother Evans talk on this. Um, what I what I love about this this chapter here is, uh, well, one thing that's interesting is that when when Job answers, uh, God answers Job. 
he barrages him. He, he doesn't just have a thing or two to briefly to say. He barrages Job with questions about his creation. You know, Job, I've done this. Can you? Do you know this about it? Do you know this about my creation? Do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know? It, it's really just machine guns, Job, with question after question after question about things that he knows that Job doesn't have a clue about. He doesn't have the answers. And I, I think that's that's very interesting because uh, it, it's it's a, in a way it's it, God is. Uh, showing Job very clearly and very profoundly that he is utterly ignorant in comparison to, to him. And to, to, to give him perspective, it seems, you know, Job, look, you know, uh, you think you have the answer to things, but do you know this? Do you know that? Do you know the other? 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 It, 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 it would be interesting um, to see that I think in some other text you might find, you know, a historical text about a religion, you know, maybe a god asking a question or two of somebody. But here, and this is so interesting to me because God asks Job so many questions in such a brief period of time. It's just like to me dropping a book down in front of Job and saying, boom, look, you don't know anything. You're so ignorant in comparison to me. You know, I want you to get a grip from it, Job, and get some perspective here, you know. And I, I just think that's fascinating that God just machine guns Job with all these very technical questions about his creation. I, I, I find it fascinating, and of course you know how I find it fascinating that when we observe the world, we see the world matches exactly all the things that God says about his creation in this book. Okay, well, the obviously God in, in this response here, uh, if a person didn't already consider this, th th this makes it clear that God's been paying attention to what's going on. I mean, God is omniscient. That is one of the characters characteristics of God is omniscience. Uh, he, he knows that what Satan was going to do to him. He permitted it. He's been observing. And uh, so now it comes to a point where he's going to uh, speak. And when he does speak, uh, he's telling him, gird your loins. I think that's saying, brace yourself. I'm going to, you know, you're not going to like what I'm going to tell you right now, but I need to humble you for a minute here. Because I know you know I've been paying attention, and you've been complaining, uh, talking about how innocent and righteous you are, and you know you are, but uh, you don't know this, and you don't know that, and you don't know this, and and it, it gives us perspective. You talked about brother Evan. You said God says this to give Job perspective, but I think that this statement, this chapter, and and all of Job was written to give all of us perspective. Uh, on on suffering and also on the greatness of God and how how tiny we are. I'm not I'm just not much more than a, a particle of dust in the universe, and yet God loves me so much that He would become a man and die just for me. Uh, and but this way we we see the vastness and greatness of God, uh, and this it, He's going to really make it clear in this chapter. But it's for all of our benefit. Let me read the next couple of verses and. Get your reaction to that. It says, um, verse 4, uh, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you know and have understanding, who determined the measurements of the earth, if you know? Or who stretched the measuring line on it? I'll stop there. That's just verse 4 and 5. And uh, let me let me ask Brother Evan to go first on these. I think he'll have a lot more to say, and then uh, I'd like Brother Stephen to react to respond to what Brother Evan says each time. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I was I was caught up talking to uh, Sharon about something. Could you uh, ask me what it, what it was you wanted me to comment? Did you did you read verse? Uh, did you follow along with verse four and five? Yeah, um, hold on. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, hold on. 
Well, I guess I could give a brief comment while we're waiting. Well, I mean, looking at, you know, first of all, Lincoln said this is a barrage of statements. You know, regardless, you know, Job may have been a righteous man, you know, in worldly terms, and he may have been God's best example. But in reality, when compared to God, he's still nothing. And, you know, this is, like you said, you know, gird up. You know, it's prepared for this barrage. And so God's really starting to kind of show it because, like, you know, were you there, you know, when I created the earth? You know, were you there when I, you know, took, like, you know, the dimension, you know, of everything? Or, you know, it's just showing that, you know, I would say it's just showing, you know, how mighty, you know, God is. And, you know, Job wasn't, you know, a part of all of that. And, you know, there's no way Job, you know, could, you know, really answer these questions. So it's really kind of just putting you in your place. But, you know, it's, you know, out of love. But... I'll let you know, Brother Evan, you know, continue on, but I'll give my response to him when he's done. Yeah, Brother Evan, are you still tied up? Oh, there you are. Uh, if you're available, uh, uh, comment on verses four and five for us. Okay. Uh, well, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? The foundations of the earth, we could say, if we look at the earth from a scientific view, would be the mantles of the earth. The inner parts of the mantles and the outer part, you have the crust and the lithosphere, which is like the skin of the earth. So here, it seems to me that God is, is talking about where, where he says, asks, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I created the core of the earth, the inner parts of the earth, the very strength of this earth? And then he asks him, he says, who hath laid the measures thereof? Uh, if thou knowest, I, I guess, can you do the mathematics? You know, can you tell me how many, uh, how many, uh, how many trillion tons of matter there is? You know, what is the measurement of it? Do you know the exact measurement of the Earth? Who has stretched a line upon it? Or who on this planet, who on the Earth, has ever actually accurately been able to measure the the width of it? or the size of the earth, but I created it knowing exactly how much uh, according to my my desire. And so God is saying, uh, I, I made the earth exactly the size that it is and weighs exactly what it weighs, and that's because I, I declared it to be so. Can you tell me how much it weighs? Can you tell me how wide it is? Can you tell me the circumference thereof? You know, I, so it seems to me God is asking Job, you know, if he knows the science of the earth, uh, if he if he's able to measure the earth, where it's God being outside of, you know, uh, no having no all knowledge, God knows the exact dimensions of the earth, and Job doesn't know any of this. Let me ask you to respond to the, the word foundation. It seems to me, if uh, I was uh, uh, alive, uh, 1500 B.C if that's the time frame for this, uh, these events. Uh, and uh, would I be thinking, even in terms of Earth ha having a foundation, to me I would, I would just be aware that, oh, there's sky above, there's stars, and there's sun, and there's moon, and there's land and water. I, wouldn't, I don't know why, why the word foundation would even come to my mind, and yet here we find it. What do you... Did you already explain what you think foundation is in in uh, in uh, terms today? I think I think so because the inner parts of the earth really determines a lot of what's going on in the crust. So this is post flood. Uh, uh, Job lived post flood. So shortly after the, not long after the Tower of Babel affair, probably within two, maybe three generations after the Tower of Babel affair. Uh, the earth was relatively, uh, the, the cultures of the world were new when, when Job, when, this, when, when, when the events took place that this book is, is talking about. Um, man had not, there was probably not even yet two million people on the earth. And, and so, uh, but I think where, where it says foundations, I think it's talking about the inner parts of the earth. That's, that's my take. Now, it could be wrong, but that's my, my take on it is that God is talking about the insides of the earth. Because remember, God is asking him if he knows this. Um, it, it, this is something that Job doesn't is not able to see. 
Now, Job can see the ground that he walks upon, but he's not able to see inside the earth a thousand miles or, or 3,000 miles. And so I, I think to, uh, a better perspective of this passage is uh, God is asking about something Job has absolutely no knowledge of whatsoever. I mean, not not that he has knowledge about what he was, you know, the surface of the earth he has walked around, but, but something that is completely outside of his scope, absolutely outside of his realm of knowledge, which is the interior of the earth. So God says, hey, where were you when I laid the foundations of it? The, you know, the very in, in inner parts of this planet upon which the crust that you're walking around on actually rests. That's, that's the perspective from creation science that I get from this passage. All right, let me go on to the next verse. Uh, let me see, that was 4 and 5. Starting with verse 6. Um, on what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, the angels, shouted for joy. Uh, let me stop there, just verse 6, is six and 7. Uh, Brother Evan, will you go first on this, and then we'll get Brother Stephen to respond to your comment. Well, some people might say, uh, from hearing some of my commentary on these passages, that I, I go a little overboard with the creation science on it. And I get that. I understand why they might think so. But I've seen a, a whole lot of real science in the Bible, things that we couldn't have known in, the, in, in ancient times that we can look at now about the earth and we see the Word of God actually described it and accurately so. And so I see things in, in the Bible, you know as well as I do, that I, I think there are many examples in the Bible where the Bible explains a thing in, in a way that, it seems like on the surface it says, you know, one thing. But if you look at it deeper, you can also find a much more deeper, uh, also a separate truth in what the Word of God says. Just like in the book of Romans where it says, you know, that they worship the creature more than the creator. Uh, I think that's not only a reference to uh, talking about that man made false images with his hands to worship idols, but also the, a, a foretelling of the coming of the evolution theory built right into the passage. So... The many passages in the Bible tell us two stories at the same time, and both are true. Yeah, and I think that's kind of what's happening here. I think this passage, uh, there's a lot of scientific, real hardcore scientific understanding that God has here that he's telling us about, and when we examine the earth, we see it's true. So where it says, we're upon the foundations fastened, that sounds to me, from my creationist perspective, God is asking Job, that, remember, he already mentioned, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Right? So he's already mentioned foundations. Then, then he says, w w uh, two, two passages later, whereupon are the foundations that are fastened? So, in other words, I think he's asking, how does the, the, the foundations of the earth relate to the part of it that you're walking upon? What's the relationship between them? Does one move beyond the, uh, under the other? Are they fixed together? Uh, what's uh, what's the slip and slide there? Do you know? I, I think God is really putting some serious scientific knowledge well over Job's head here. All right, Brother Stephen, before, before I go on, what's your response? I mean, yeah, I agree. There's a... Oh, I agree with a lot of what he said. You know, with every, you know, verse, you know... I mean, not every single one, but with, you know, many things in Scripture that you can definitely... There can definitely be a more, you know, spiritual meaning, you know, or connections drawn, you know, and, you know, any ounce of scripture. But, yeah, there's definitely, you know, a lot of science, you know, in all this type of stuff. Like, I know we were talking about, you know, foundations, you know, in the last verse. Well, actually, it's still in this one. And, of course, you know, the foundation, you know, I think about it, you know, in building terms. You know, the thing that, you know, all the weight is bore on, you know, where all the loads are, you know, are bore. And, of course, you know, for the Earth, you know, you would think that's the center of the Earth because, you know, the gravity is all pushing in here to, you know, to that one point at the core. So it's all being, you know, born, you know, on the core. But, you know, just the big thing is, you know, when you talk about all these scientific facts like measurements or like the core, you know, the different, you know, phases of geology that could be in there or, you know, even like a solid core or a liquid core, 
or just the dimensions or the weight of everything. It just shows, you know, how mighty God is, you know, in comparison to Job. And that's what he's, you know, showing, you know, here in this statement. And I feel like I could say a lot more, but I'm going to stop here because I feel like that's the essence of it. I, I like your, your comment about the foundations, uh, uh, like relating to a building or something. I think that's an interesting perspective. I think that's a very good one. Uh, that that is, in fact, how I think we should look at that passage. In fact, God's asking, you know, you're walking around on the surface of the earth, but where's the foundation, Job? Do you know the foundation? Do you know anything about it? So that's a very interesting comment. I like that very much. We build a house upon a foundation, right? And Jesus mentioned foundations and houses, right, in his parable. I, I think that's a very good way of looking at it. Yeah, because like. You know, a weak foundation on anything, the building is not going to fare out well and, you know, is prone to collapse. But, you know, with a strong foundation, well, Jesus used the rock and the sand. But, you know, it's just showing, you know, how this earth is, you know, being so stable. You know, it has a strong foundation, obviously. And, you know, and of course, God knew exactly the weight. I mean, because I've seen so many things about this universe where, you know, even the slightest difference, and, you know, in life wouldn't even be possible. It just shows you know, how mighty God is, you know, and what he and how he knows what he's doing, and you know the amount of calculations God can make to make sure you know life is possible for us. Well, he did create this universe either way, but still, it just shows you know how amazing you know he is. And yeah, he some, a lot of engineering, a lot of thoughtfulness God put into his creation, isn't it? Definitely. But all right, I, we've been rambling on this verse, so I'd say we should move on. All right, before we move on, though, um, the, um, you both rough, you cited the word science or scientific. And I know that there are people who argue, well, the Bible's not a science book. And I, I would agree the Bible's not a science book, but I, I would argue that the Bible, Bible is completely scientifically correct. There's no scientific er mistakes in, in the Bible. Uh, things that uh, people did not even know of, uh, because science had not advanced, uh, let's say, a thousand years, two, th three thousand years ago, um, are stated in the Bible. And there's many examples that could be given that uh, the scripture says something that it took man another thousand or two thousand years to discover that the scientific truth of it. So over and over again, we discover that. Uh, science supports the Bible. Uh, however, the Bible really is a is a book. It's a it's a story about our Savior and our salvation, but it's also a history book. I, I think of it more of as a history book than a science book because these stories of Job and Genesis and Exodus and uh, you know the the gospel accounts and the the epistles of the, the these things are all stories of historic. Uh, events and people, and they're true stories. Uh, so it's uh, it's a story about salvation. It's a, a history book, but it is scientifically correct. So before we go on, if you want to respond to that before I say anything, uh, go on to the next verse. No, go go ahead. Let's, let's keep going. okay. All right. So now we got uh, verse eight. Uh, or who enclosed the sea with doors? when it burst forth and went out of the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and marked for it my appointed boundary and set bars and doors defining the shorelines. I'll stop there. That's verses uh, uh, 7 through 10. Did you want us to comment on this? Is that what you were pausing for? Uh, yeah. What what I'm what I'm attempting to do is um, a, let you give a response and Stephen give a response, and then I'll I'll make any final comments before we go on. But I'll 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 ask you to make your first comment on the verse if that's all right. Unless unless you want me to comment first. But uh, yeah. Well, if, what, if you got some thoughts you want to share, and then we'll go ahead and make ours. Um. Well, the who let me read it again then. Or, or who enclosed the sea 
with doors or when it burst forth and went out of the womb. Now, I, I can't. I have no idea what that's referencing, except that the the sea has its doorways. It, it, the, the way the oceans, the shorelines, and the waves break, and uh, it's a referencing that I think. And it says, "When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling." Of course, he's claiming that they have to have created all these things and marked for it by appointment boundaries and set bars and doors defining the shorelines. So what you see is not a, a result of just things happening uh, through uh, random events. It's, it's a design. He designed things to be this way. Absolutely. In fact, um, not, not to move ahead, but just to, to make the observation, about the next 25 passages in, this, in the book are all relating to the Noah, Noahic flood. All, uh, um, they, they're all relating to the events of the of the flood of Noah, and they're describing geologic features of the earth that we can see today, and that matches the word of God. In in, in verse eight, we see, "Or who shut up the sea with doors?" Now, if we ex if we go down six miles deep on the ocean floors, we find that there are cracks in the earth's floor, the ocean uh, in the crust of the earth that go around the earth like the seam of a baseball. They're called the mid-oceanic ridges. And they're, they go to a depth of six miles down. Now, no, no human being could have known they existed at that time, of course, because the pressure at that depth is 64,000 pounds per square inch. You would pop a basketball long before you know it got even 100 feet deep. This, the pressure is so deep, uh, great there that a, a military submarine would implode like an a empty soda can in the hand of a straw man. Long, I mean, well before it got to that depth, way before. So uh, nobody could have known about what the God is saying in, in these passages. Now, so where this, this is how God flooded the earth. He split the earth, split the crust, and massive amounts of hot mineral-laden water came sh shooting out of the earth at these mid-oceanic ridges. Some of hot water is still coming out along them in the form of hydrothermal vents along the ocean floors. So hot water is still coming out. So now where it says, or who shut up the door, the sea with doors? If we examine the ocean floor at, at the bottom of these mid-oceanic ridges, it's believed that there is basalt, a form of rock, which is bowed up to close off these mid-oceanic ridges. In other words, when the waters for the, that flooded the earth came forth, out, they, the crust of the sea sank down to fill that empty space. As the water came out, the earth's crust sank down on top of this rock, and this rock bowed up into it to seal off these mid-oceanic ridges. That is exactly what we see with seismographic images. So we actually can see with seismography the actual doors that God used to shut up these uh, cracks in the earth where he where the flood waters burst forth. So that's what this passage is referring to. Who shut up the sea with doors? He shut it up. In other words, the, 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 where is on this planet is the sea shut up? You know, sealed off. It's not. It's freely floating everywhere, but not there. Not, not at the cracks in the earth where the waters came forth. The sea came forth, and God has shut it with doors. He, notice he says, when it break forth. See, that's the event that caused the flood of Noah. God split the earth and the waters rushed out. He says, who shut it up when it break forth? So he's saying, who shut it up after it broke open? Well, it was me. I, I sealed it with basalt. And he says, as it had issued out of the womb. Now, we know that when a woman gives birth, she gives forth a, 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 a volume of water, Right. This is, God is likening this to a womb. We're going to see another reference to a womb further on in this book of Job, in these passages, referring to a, a womb. Whose, whose womb did it come from? So here we see that God is likening the interior of the earth to a womb. The water that came forth from it, which caused the flood of Noah, when it break forth, and we go back to the beginning of the passage, and who shut it up with doors, which are basalt rock, it was God. This is absolutely fascinating because this 
is scientific knowledge thousands of years about geologic features of the earth that man could not have known and did not know until the latter half of the 20th century. We did not even know that these cracks existed on the ocean floors until the latter half of the 1800s and they were not actually being able to see them with any kind of clarity or images or, or know anything really about them until the latter half of the 20th century. In fact, the hydrothermal vents that line the ocean, these ridges were not discovered until 1977. And we here we have over a thousand years before Christ, God describing a geologic feature of the earth that we discover in the 1970s. It's utterly fascinating. So here we see the mechanism for the flood. God splits the open, the womb of the earth, the water of it bursts forth, and God seals it up with doors, which is a solid basalt rock. Now where, where he says, when I made of the cloud the garment thereof, and a thick sw uh, darkness a swaddling for it. Now all these are events, one related to the other. So what happened in verse 8, or who shut up the sea doors, is related to what's coming here in verse 9. When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and the darkness a swaddling band for it. See, during the flood of Noah, the continents grinding their way across the earth ground billions and billions of tons of rock into a molten state because of friction and created volcanoes all over this earth in the crust. It was the continents moving away from these ridges where God split the earth open at that womb that ultimately resulted in a massive amounts of volcanic activity during the onset, during the, up to the middle perhaps of the flood of time of the flood of Noah. So now where does this cloud, a garment thereof, this a thick darkness, a swaddling band for it? No, so the word is swaddling band. Jesus Christ was wrapped in swaddling cloth, which was burial cloth. He was marked for a death at his birth. Swaddling cloth is burial cloth. It's a long, thin strip of material that somebody would wrap around the body, around, around, around. So this goes all around and around and around the earth. And it's dark. Well, that's because during the flood of Noah, these a tremendous number of volcanoes that burst forth because of the activity, geologic, geologic activity of the flood, filled the atmosphere of the earth with ash, blocking out the sun and making the upper atmosphere of the earth extremely cold, icy cold. The earth was dark like night during most of the flood of Noah, or half of it. Noah was under darkness for probably at least a couple of months. It was like night outside the ark. And so here we see God is telling us these events in order, in fact, if we go backwards through verse 8, as it issued out of the womb, God splits the earth open because it broke forth and he shut it up later and this resulted in a garment of darkness that covered the earth. And so this is God explaining the events of the flood of Noah which happened only probably two to three, four hundred years before this book is described, the events, the life of Job. If Job did live 14 to 1500 BC, then these events took place only five, or, or, or I mean, just several hundred years before Job lived. This wasn't that long ago in history before Job. So, uh, it, Job is here. God is describing the uh, geologic activity of the earth, which during the flood of Noah. Well, the uh, the explanation and the, the fact that you've uh, relating this to the flood, it would not have entered my mind if you hadn't said this relates to the flood. And I think that that would be the case with many people reading this. Uh, I, we think of it in terms of God describing His creation, but when you look at it carefully, as you as, listening to you, I, I can see how this is obviously the flood, and the the use of the word swaddling. Uh, what how, how is it phrased again? Uh, swaddling band, uh, and of course swaddling. Uh, that's what uh, the that's what you use to bury people in, 
it's a it's a material for burial and uh, Jesus when he was born he was wrapped in swaddling clothes that was a picture that he's born to die and so the idea that this being a swaddling band would indicate that this is talking about the death of all mankind uh, so yeah I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, well, that's a good perspective now that's something I haven't thought about I thought about the swaddling thing but you just mentioned something I hadn't thought about brother you said the death of all mankind no doubt that's a good perspective I hadn't thought about that I'm so glad you mentioned that that's exactly right he's, he's in fact mentioning that everything on the earth you know the scripture says that everything that creeped on the surface of the earth died during the flood and here we see the use of the word swaddling band that's an excellent perspective I'm so glad you mentioned that I had never thought of that that's beautiful all right let's see if brother Stephen has anything to say about those verses yeah, I really like that connection um, to know to like the Noah's flood. I wouldn't have thought about that, you know. Also, at first glance, and as well as the swaddling thing about you know men being you know born to die, just being able to draw those connections. But yeah, like it is very fascinating that you know the Bible here, you know, can accurately state you know all these you know geological sciences, you know, about you know the mid ocean as I took geology about like the mid ocean ridge you know, the basalt, you know, and showing, you know, how it significantly can, you know, change, you know, like the ocean. And, you know, this is being stated well before this is even discovered. Like, no man had known about this up to this point. So, I mean, there's no, this literally shows that there's no way that this book was written by just men. It's definitely, you know, the Word of God, looking at it. And just, you know, but, you know, as I said, Mostly this is just still showing you know, just the comparison of God to Job and just like how mighty God is in comparison. So, you know, I'll stop here and can't wait to get on to the next one. Well, one, one thing before we move on is that uh, we were talking for a few minutes before we started the live broadcast and uh, discussing the, the time frame where Job fits. And uh, Brother Evan, you, you said that uh, it was probably about 1500 BC and I, I, I said that when I started this study uh, uh, the research I came up with was that there are varying opinions on this one of the opinions was this was pre-flood and then the other opinions was it was after the flood but before Moses and another one was it was possibly even during the time of Moses but I think that um, if, the, if we're correct here, and I'm, I'm strongly in, inclined to believe that this is a reference to the flood, and, and therefore it would have had to be after the flood for the time frame. And so your, uh, your uh, uh, claim or theory that, that it, this was several hundred years after the flood seems to fit right for me. Okay, I'll go on. Um, now we're on... Let me see. Verse 11. Uh, and said, This far you shall come, but no farther, and here your proud waves shall stop. I should have read that verse along with the last one. Uh, but going on to verse 12, it says, Since your days began, have you ever commanded the morning or caused the dawn to know its place? so that light may take hold of the corners of the earth and shake the wickedness out of it? Uh, that's verse uh, 12 and 13. Uh, if you want me to go first, I'll say that uh, the, uh, again, he's, he's asking Job, and these are all questions of Job to, to, to humble Job. And uh, I believe that Job has been very humble and uh, uh, throughout this whole ordeal, uh, and yet God feels there's a need to to let him uh, know that wait a second, you're a man and I'm God, so don't question whether whether uh, you know uh, things are uh, unfair or not. Yeah, you you are uh, an innocent man, 
And it's not, by the way, it's not me that's punishing you, it's the, the devil. But, um, and you're not being punished because of your wickedness. Uh, you're, you're being punished because I selected you as the most righteous man. But you need the perspective to know that I am God and uh, this will be used, you know, for my purpose. And, and uh, look, I, this, I can do, I've done all this. So don't challenge, don't even think of not challenging, but uh, questioning that, hey, this seems unfair. Um, so that's that's the point I think he's making by these this entire um, um, uh, what how does it start off uh, 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 gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and, and instruct me so he's putting Job in his place but I didn't really detect any like arrogance of Job or um, anything in the previous chapters that, that would indicate that he's just arrogant and needs to be put in his place. So I, I, I suspect this is to just uh, lay, lay down the law and say, look, you're a man and I'm God and uh, you, can't, you can't do what I've done. Do you, can you answer all these questions? So obviously he's going to ask him, ask him a series of questions that, that shows that Job is, is just merely a man even though he may be the best man. Uh, on the earth, uh, he's uh, he's just a man. Um, so twelve and thirteen. Do you have anything to say about that? Um, well, where it, I think it's interesting that where it says, "Hast thou commanded the morning since the, thy days?" Uh, who who's the one in control of the ordinances of the planets? Well, it's not you, Job. Certainly, yes, me, and. This is an interesting one, and cause the day spring to know thy place. Now, day spring is a word that's hardly ever used anymore, but it was used in the days of King James when this translation was made. And what it refers to is, uh, and it is the the lighted edge of the earth where the sun rises. You can see it on a relatively flat area, but it's best seen from outer space, believe it or not. If you look at the Earth from, let's say, a space capsule, and you're looking at the Earth where the Sun is on the back side of the Earth, you'll see a lighted edge of the Earth where the Sun is beginning to rise around the edge of the Earth. That's the day spring. So the day spring is that area of the Earth that is, that is being continuously lighted by the Sun as the Sun is rising. It's the edge between darkness and, and light, night and day, where the, where the Sun is coming uh, uh, onto the earth. It's the day spring. And so, by the way, this passage tells us the earth is round because if it were not round, it would have no day spring. When the sun rose, if the earth were flat and the sun rose, if the logically, if the earth were perfectly flat, let's just look at it from a, from a most dumbed down perspective. If the earth were perfectly flat, when the sun rose, the, the, the sun would shine across the entire surface of the entire Earth. Now, let's imagine, uh, dumb it down a little from the Earth that we do have. Let's imagine a sphere that's perfectly smooth, with no mountains, no hills, or valleys. It would have a day spring, even if it were perfectly smooth on its surface. So, the only way the Earth can have a day spring is if it's round. So... I, I know it's. I'm stretching. I'm, I'm going a little bit off topic here, but for those who believe in a flat Earth, and for the atheists who say that the Earth, the Bible describes a flat Earth, you're clearly wrong. The Bible is telling us unequivocally right here: the Earth is a sphere. I, I was uh, shocked uh, just a few months ago. When uh, I learned about there really are flat earthers today, uh, because because I've I've always uh, been defensive that um, the uh, secularists, the atheists, uh, they they are quick to call us flat earthers, thinking that we are not looking at anything from a scientific perspective. That like we're back in the days when people believed that the Earth was flat. And it's a it's an insult, uh, but uh, I always felt well. None of us believe the Earth is flat. That's that's absurd. And then I discovered 
recently that there are uh, more people, some people that I actually thought were really very intelligent, reasonable people, and they 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 believe that. It's been pretty amazing to me to to see this. But um, I, I argue that when we when we take that position, uh, we're inviting uh, the the attack from from the atheists and secularists that uh, you can't be take take those people seriously. I mean, after all, they even think the Earth is flat and there's not even a moon. It's just an illusion or a, or a what do they call it? An, um, an image or a projection. <laughs> so when people take that that position, they they hurt us all because they 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 make us all lose credibility because those crazy Christians think still think the Earth is flat and the, the moon's a projection. Yeah, and I don't remember how long that was a debate between you know flat versus round Earth, but it's still just continuing to you know answer you know all these questions, and especially when talking about you know like day spring and just the significance of that. It again just shows you know how powerful you know God is you know in this situation, and you know and how you know humble you know Job should be because you know as righteous as he is, you know he's still nothing. You know, next to God, who can do all these things, you know, from shaping the foundations of the earth, to the way the light strikes the earth, the, you know, the shape of the earth, the size, the weight. It's just showing the significance of all of that and showing, you know, how big God is, you know, in comparison to Job. All right, let me, let me say this, that uh, um, uh, Brother Stephen has, has, has been with me quite often on these broadcasts. And Brother Evan, uh, you're always welcome, but uh, I'm real happy that you could be here for uh, Chapter 38. Normally, I keep these broadcasts an hour, um, but it depends upon your schedule. That you know, if, if you think that you can join us again, because this may take two or three parts if I limit it to an hour. But if we go through the rest of it and try to complete it now. Uh, I'm willing to do it, but I don't know if your schedules permit or if it would be better to break this up into uh, two or three segments. So what do you think? Oh, hold on. Do I, oh, yeah, my mic's on. Um, only problem is, like, I do have an early class tomorrow, and so I will want to get some sleep before that. But I could probably go on for another half hour or so. Brother Evan, which, which is best for you? I'm sorry, I stepped away for a second. Sharon is uh, Sharon suffering with a lot of pain tonight, and, and I was talking to her. I'm, I'm sorry, what were you asking me about? Uh, yeah, I, I posed the question uh, that uh, normally I do these live broadcasts nightly for one hour, and it, at this rate, though, it'll take us probably three episodes to complete this. Oh. And uh, Brother Stephen has been with me quite often. And in your case, uh, your your schedule doesn't always permit you to participate. But I'm glad you could be here for Chapter 38. But if, if we could either do this, try to continue and get through Chapter 38 in one sitting, if you if it's better for you, if, if if it's okay, we could also split it up and continue. I think we could do it. It's not that much more. I mean, we're halfway through it now. Um, you know, if 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 we uh, if we don't take too long, I think we can get through it in the next thirty forty minutes. All right. Right. Uh, that's okay. It's okay with me. So we'll go ahead and Brother Stephen, stay with us as long as long as you can. I don't want to uh, affect. Oh, your I'm sorry. I didn't understand that he might have to go. Yeah, he oh. might have to go in maybe a half hour or forty-five oh, minutes. Oh well, then yeah, we we could break it up. I I can try to make it another night if you if you want to do it in in, in two sittings or three. Yeah. Uh, I I think he's willing to go on, but he can't be here for an hour or two. But if we can do it in thirty or forty minutes, it'd be okay. So let's yeah. let's try. We'll try to go through the remainder more quickly. Okay. Yeah, I think we can get it done in thirty minutes. Uh, okay, let me go on then. I'll, I'll read more larger portions and then ask you to respond here. Uh, so we're on verse uh, 14. It says, The earth is changed like clay into which a seal is pressed, 
and the things of the earth stand out like a multicolored garment. Their light is withheld from the wicked, and the uplifted arm is broken. Uh, so let me ask you to respond to that. I'll, I'll save time by letting you go first. Uh, I think those passages are fairly fairly simple compared to the rest of the book. Um, I, I, I think it, it's just a description of uh, you know God's wisdom in general. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty you know simple, but I know I like to look at you know like the clay here. You know, in this one, and it just kind of reminds me of soils and how, you know, things, you know, it like expands and contracts, you know, and can be, you know, formed. Like, you know, how like a potter would form something. So, I don't know, just the word close stood out to me, but overall I don't have too much comment here. I've heard the creationist scientists have a very good and interesting perspective on that passage, but I haven't. Uh, actually studied what they say about that one. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking perhaps the, the clay relates back to uh, the previous verses when we were talking about the floods and the waters and then of course uh, uh, wouldn't clay require moisture to, to be clay so is it, re is it continuing to discuss the idea that there's a flood and now yeah. now the, the, the dirt is can be pressed together into different shapes like clay? I think so, because uh, massive amounts of clay were dumped onto the earth during the flood, were created during the flood, chemically. So, yeah, I, I believe there is some creation science behind that uh, relating to the flood. Okay, verse 15. Their, uh, their light, oh, verse 16. Have you entered and explored the seas of this, the springs of the sea? Or have you walked into the recesses of the deep? Uh, I'll, I'll take that for singularly because I think you uh, you can relate that to uh, uh, creation science. Oh, absolutely. This is a reference to the hydrothermal vents that line the ocean floors, not discovered until 1977. They were called, here they're called springs. If we go to the Greek, I mean the Hebrew, we find that springs is nabek, and that means a bursting forth of water. So here it's describing bursting forths of water in the sea. And hast thou walked into search of the depth? God is asking Job literally in this passage. Have you walked from the shore down to the ocean, to the bottom of the ocean, to see the springs of water that are there? Which, of course, we know would be absolutely impossible. No human being could do it. Uh, you couldn't withstand the pressure and you couldn't do without the oxygen. So God is literally asking Job, have you walked all the way down onto the, to the very deep depth of the sea? Now, it, depth there is tahom, that's the Hebrew word, and it means literally abyss. So when this passage is talking about depth here, it's not talking about 20 feet down, 50 feet. It means down, 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 the abyss. <laughs> That's what the word means, literally in Hebrew. It, it means the abyss. I have I've, I've studied this passage quite. Ex I have a video on my YouTube channel about this passage alone. So God is asking Job, Job, have you walked down to the very depths of the sea, into the very abyss of the sea, to see the water that's bursting forth on the ocean floor? Those weren't discovered until 1977. Yeah, it's, it's an example of what I cited earlier, that there are many things that uh, science knows now. The Bible spoke of thousands of years prior to it, and they, there, was no, there were no microscopes and telescopes or uh, uh, any, any scientific tools or things to, to study those things. And only centuries later did we have the c capacity to, to see for ourselves and go down into the oceans and see these things. But and yet the Bible tells us there's springs in, in the deep. That's right. In fact, it, it was believed all the way through human history until uh, the late 1800s that the ocean floors were smooth and, and featureless. That's what they actually believed. But now in the 20th century, they discovered something completely different. 
There are mountains down there, mountains and crevasses, and there are ocean springs. And so God is asking here, Job, if he knows about the bursting forth of water on the ocean floor in the very depth of the sea, the deep, deep, abysmal part of the sea, the depth, the home. And uh, so that's relating to the flood. Of course, the hydrothermal vents were created during the flood of Noah. Or shortly thereafter, as a result of it. Yeah, you know, just another, you know, there's more significance about, you know, explaining just more science, and of course about, you know, the size of God. So, you know, I'll just be saying the same thing I said last time. So, I think we're ready to move on. All right. Um, yeah, the it not only talks about the uh, the the springs in the deep, but also the mountains. And the, the, the Bible tells us there's mountains underneath the oceans, and, and, and yet, uh, how would we know? We weren't capable of exploring those areas centuries ago. Uh, verse um, uh, 17, have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Um, if this verse is not talking about the deep darkness in the ocean, uh, then I would just say that it's this uh, death. Obviously, uh, God's using death and the, the spiritual realm as a uh, uh, another example of, look, you don't know anything about this either. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, Do you want to say something about that before we go on? Yeah, I think it's both. I think this is a passage in the Bible, like I said, that, that means two things at the same time. I think it means exactly what you said. Do you know anything about the transition from life into death? Do you know what, what that's about? And it's also uh, talking about the gates of death. What are the gates of death? The gates of death would be the mid-oceanic ridges which cracked open that brought death to all living things on the earth. It's speaking of two things at once here. The, the onset of the flood of Noah, as well as what you mentioned. All right, let me go on here. Uh, verse 18, have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me, if you know all this, where is the way where light dwells? And as for darkness, where is its place that you may take to its territory and that you may know the paths to its house? <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, I'm not going to attempt to explain that, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. This is a statement that light travels distance over time, something not understood or believed by anyone on the earth until Sir Isaac Newton in the 1500s wrote his thesis, Optics. Uh, he was the first person on the earth to put forth the idea that light actually travels distance over time. Prior to that, everyone on the earth believed that light was instantaneous. When you, when you, when you uh, uh, light a candle or when you, when, when you see a spark or the light travels instantaneously to its place of instance where it reflects, there is no time in between. Today we know that's true, not true. We know that light takes time to travel from where it begins to where it goes. And the passage here is saying, uh, where is the way that light dwelleth? Where is the path? Okay. As for the darkness, in other words, where is the place thereof? In other words, light is both uh, matter and energy at the same time. You can measure where light exists and where it does not exist. This is a statement of physics. That thou should take it to the bound thereof, that means to where it reflects on something. If you click on a flashlight, that's the bound of it. Where it, where, where it, lets it, where it strikes the wall, that's the bound. And that thou should know the path to the house thereof. In other words, let's turn on the flashlight. We, we see the light striking the wall. Now let's trace back that light to the house of the light from where it came, from which it came. In other words, now to travel a path requires time. People walk a path. They don't do it instantly. It takes them time to walk the path. This passage is telling us light travels from where it begins, the house of thereof, to the incidents thereof, the bound, and it takes time for that to happen. This is a statement of, of physics thousands of years uh, before man could uh, have any understanding about it. It's a, it, particle physics in the Bible, 1500 B.C. Yeah, Brother Stephen, what your, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, just, 
it's still just amazing showing and I wouldn't have you know been able to really look at this you know without you know Evan's perspective just showing you know all this you know stuff it talks about you know science like here we're talking about you know like how light travels you know and like the time of it and it's just like no one knew any of this stuff and it wouldn't be discovered you know for so long afterwards but yet the Bible you know is clearly pointing it out so I mean to me it's just amazing but overall, I don't have any additional comments at this point. Yeah, I'm so happy that uh, uh, Brother Evans, uh, you're able to participate tonight with this particular chapter. I mean, if if I was trying to explain this chapter entirely on my own, it would it would be very sophomoric in comparison. Uh, mostly just talking about how God is emphasizing His greatness and the. Uh, the smallness of Job uh, compared to God, but um, so this is very, very interesting. Um, I, I think this this chapter should be a lesson for every atheist in the world to study, because what they'll find is uh, science three thousand five hundred years before the hand in the Bible, and it should be enough to make anybody scratch their head. How does the Bible know it so accurately and true? Yeah. All right. Let me go on then. Uh, verse uh, verse twenty one. You must know, since you were born then, and because you are so extremely old, <laughs> have you entered the storehouses? <laughs> That's sarcasm, because we learned in an earlier chapter, Job is the the young man compared to the three visitors. They're the old man. But he says, you must know, so I'm sure this is sarcasm. You must, obviously, it's, he's not old compared to the earth anyway, but uh, he says, you must know since you were born then and because you are so extremely old. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? I'll let, let you talk about that. I, I think this is a relatively simple statement in comparison to some of the others in this passage, in, in this book. I, I think it's basically just God asking if he understands the physics behind the creation of snow and hail and understands the origin of, of, of them in, in, in the earth. Entered into the treasures of the snow. However, an interesting thing is, if you examine snow or hail with a microscope, you find a treasure of, of, of beautiful architecture. It's truly a phenomenal. Look at a snowflake with a scanning electron microscope and it'll blow your mind. Uh, so there could be some, some further uh, hidden knowledge in that that it's not obvious. Yeah, pretty simple. You know, just showing again, like just what Evan said, I think he summed it up pretty well. Well, I would only add that uh, the, the point about... Uh, which I have reserved for the time of trouble for the day of battle and war. And, and she's make, also making the point that not only uh, do I make the snow and the hail, but I can, I can use it for my purpose when I want to. If I want to um, bring this down on someone, I'm able to do that. I, uh, let me go on. Verse 24 says, um, Where is the way that the light is distributed or the east wind scattered over the earth? Who has prepared a channel for the torrents of rain and for the flood, or a path for the thunderbolt, to bring rain on the uninhabited land and on the desert where no man lives, to satisfy the barren and desolate ground and to make the seeds of grass to sprout? I'll leave it at that. All right. I think it's interesting, but it says, by way, what way, I'm reading from the KJV, by what way is the light parted? Now, it's interesting that it says, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth. We know today that the thermal energy of the sun causes wind patterns or global wind patterns on the earth. They didn't know that then. The Bible is mentioning it here. Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning and thunder, uh, divided a water course uh, for the overflowing of waters. In other words, God, God decreed by which means the waters that, which caused the flood of Noah would, would burst forth from the earth. And in a way for the lightning and thunder, a way meaning a, a means by which it can take place. 
every drop of snow, every every bit of hail, every lightning bolt, every landslide, every earthquake, every tsunami on this earth is a result of the earth being corrupted by the flood of Noah. The earth was geologically perfectly stable prior to the flood. So every lightning bolt that you see is a result of the flood because the earth's crust is now deformed. It was not in the beginning. And the electrical circuits going on inside the earth, the, 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 the electrical movement of electricity around the core, has now been diverted because the earth's materials have moved. And now there is lightning. There was no lightning on the earth prior to the flood. None. But now we have lightning. So this is a statement of geology, a result of the flood of Noah. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned lightning, you know, due to you know different pressures, you know, in clouds. But yet we actually were talking about clouds earlier and about like how like volcanic activity, you know, had it like as a cloak during like Noah's time. Mm -hmm. But of course, yeah, with a lot of changes, you know, you know, the crust or the foundation definitely about like, you know all those, you know, atmospheric pressure changes, you know, to form that type of stuff. So that's a very interesting point. That, yeah. you know, hmm? I'm sorry. Go ahead. That um, like there was no lightning, you know, before the flood. Right. You know, it's something I never really thought about before. Right. The Earth was geologically stable. Most people don't realize that almost all lightning goes from the Earth up to the sky. Very little of it actually starts in the clouds and comes down to the Earth. The majority of it is electricity released by the Earth to the negatively charged clouds. It's not. It's sometimes the opposite way around, but 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 most of the lightning is because the Earth is positively charged. The clouds are negative, and the lightning is shooting forth to the sky. And so here, the Earth has been corrupted by the flood of Noah, and now there's an electrical dis. There's a disjoint between the 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 positive negative between the Earth and its atmosphere, and there is lightning. He made a way for the lightning because of the flood. There was no way for lightning to happen before the flood. You see, remember, as we go through this, we've noticed all these passages that relate directly to the flood, specifically to the flood. So what we're he reading here relates to the flood also. The subject is about to change now to astronomy in these passages, however, but very quickly. But so far, almost every passage we've seen relates to the flood of the world. All right, let me continue on then. Um, uh, I think on verse 28, uh, has the rain a father, or who has begotten the drops of dew? Out of whose womb has come the ice, and the frost of heaven, who has given it birth? Water becomes like stone and hides itself, and the surface of the deep is frozen and imprisoned. All right, so that's the, this is the final part on the water. If you want to say for more on that before we move on to the astro astronomy? Yes, I do. I, I, I'll try to be quick. These are some of the most important passages in this entire chapter uh, because they are relate directly to the mechanisms of the flood. And God is telling Job about his justice and what he has done, so don't, don't think I'm unjust. God, why, why, Job, why, you're questioning my wisdom. Uh, I mean, not that he's questioning his wisdom. I mean, don't think of just questioning my wisdom. Uh, look what I have done to the earth, and I did it for just reason. Uh, who has the rain a father? In other words, does the rain cause itself? No, it has a cause. What is the cause of the rain? At the dew, uh, who hath begotten the drops of dew? What is the cause? He's saying, Job, what is the cause of rain on this earth? Well, there was no rain prior to the flood. He says, out of whose womb came the ice? Remember, we mentioned the womb earlier. The womb was of the interior of the earth from which the water came forth. He mentions ice now. It was the flood of Noah that caused the ice age. The earth split. This is a very brief description. The earth splits open. Massive amounts of hot water come out. Volcanic activity makes the, ice, uh, the skies dark. The oceans are now hot. Massive amounts of evaporation because of the hot oceans going up into an extremely cold atmosphere, which is blackened out by volcanic ash, causes a, a snowstorm on the earth like the earth has never seen nor will again. This brought ab, uh, unimaginable tons of ice and snow down upon the earth, which caused the ice age. 
and this is uh, God is describing the cause of the ice age on the earth right here it was the flood of Noah that brought it on uh, he's out of whose womb came the ice it was the earth the womb was the womb from which forth came the water remember we mentioned that before and it, it is now ice or the hoary frost or gen, uh, who had gendered it the waters are hid as with a stone the face of the deep is frozen the fact that God is mentioning this now is like saying to Job you know that the earth's waters were not frozen before but now they are the face of the deep why would he mention that the face of the deep is frozen if it wasn't a special event now they are when they weren't before you see what I mean so he's saying uh, all of a sudden now the earth the, the, and if we go to the uh, upper uh, the uh, way up in the uh, northern hemisphere of the earth we find ice sheets to cover the uh, the oceans right and they're hard as stone 18 wheelers can drive and do sometimes across these ice sheets because they'll support an 18 wheeler truck loaded with 50,000 pounds of hard of, 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 of merchandise it's like a stone so Job, God's God is telling Job now because of the flood the the oceans themselves are covered with ice and it's hard like stone now an interesting thing also is Job was is believed to have been a Hebrew man living in Israel how would he have known anything about ice sheets in the northern hemisphere, uh, hemisphere of the earth well he would not he couldn't have known this is coming from God God knows Job never traveled, it's likely. Most people in Job's day never traveled more than 50, 20, 30 miles at most from where they were born. How would Job have known what's in Scandinavia and Siberia and the Arctic? He would not have known. But God's telling us, the face of the deep is frozen. It's covered with ice. And the cause of this is the flood of Noah. Amazing. Uh, say hi to Brother Neo. What's up? Yeah, I know Nephilim Free pretty good. We are pretty good friends on here also, uh, as me and you are, Luke, I hope, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, man, uh, the, the, when I heard, when you had this hangout before about Job, I was like, oh, he's doing it again. i got to go see what he says about Job. Job. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're going from the beginning of Job all the way through. Right now we're, we're studying Chapter 38, so... It's uh, not one or two times. It's it's we've I don't know how many studies we've had, but we probably had thirty of them on Job alone, you know. But uh, uh, welcome. Uh, we're relying a lot on uh, uh, Brother uh, Evan tonight uh, on his uh, knowledge of um, the creation science and the flood. And uh, he told me once that chapter thirty-eight was a very important chapter in Job uh, with showing uh, his scientific proof of the flood. So he's been giving us a lot of information about that. We'll continue on here and feel free to comment whenever you like, brother. Um, okay, let's, uh, right now we're on, uh, uh, let me see, what verse is it? Uh, yeah, don't let me stop you. Um, everything that Neff pretty much says, I pretty much agree with Neff on like 99% of things most of the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, chapter verse thirty-one. Now we get into the astronomy that you mentioned. It says, "Can you bind the chains of the cluster of stars called Pleiades, or loose the cords of the constellation Orion? Can you lead forth the constellation in its season and guide the stars of the Bear with her sons?" Uh, I'll leave it at that and see what you have to say. I think it's interesting what that uh, whatever translation or what what translation are you reading from? Then it mentions star cluster because that's not in the King James. I think that's interesting and that's it's I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily good, but it but it is in a way because that is exactly what these passages are referring to. There is a star cluster that plays a gravitational tug of war with itself. One rotating around the other, and they're bound by bands of gravitational force. Man did not have the knowledge of such things in the day that this book was written. So this is scientific foreknowledge again in the Bible. Yeah, I, the, the reason I like the Amplified as a backup on the KJV is that uh, the word Amplified is a correct description of what it does. 
Uh, it's like having the the translators uh, of this amplified version uh, sitting here with us, and they're they've, they're amplifying, giving their thoughts, their explanation, they're expounding further rather than giving us just the scripture. It's almost like if I'm asking you to read the scripture and then explain it, but they're doing it more concisely than we are. But at least it's uh, we're getting another insight to consider. Uh, anybody want to say anything on those verses before I go to the next ones? Okay. Well, you got it pretty much. Uh, whatever was said, that's what I, I pretty much have the same kind of uh, interpretation there. Yeah. Okay, let me go on then. It says, uh, uh, do you know the ordinances of the heavens? This is verse 33. Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Or can you establish their rule over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water will cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Uh, I think I'll stop there. Your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, I, I obviously, uh, Job is this little human being on the planet. His voice won't possibly reach to the heavens. If it did, it would be dissipated so bad it wouldn't be audible by long before it got there. But of course, he's talking about God's power. You know, can can you speak to the clouds and make make them make them make them rain on you? <laughs> you know, he's already mentioned in the book that you know he he does so. But here he's asking Job, can you make uh, you know can you by your word? Why your voice uh, bring water forth from the sky, and can you send lightnings where they go and and, and come? I guess this is basically just uh, a statement, uh, uh, you know, that God has authority over all of His creation, and Job does it. It's as it seems to me. He's not only saying that, uh, can you do it, Job? But I can do it. I'm the one that can do that. You can't do it. Exactly. And, uh, it's uh, even if Job's voice could reach up there, it's not going to cause the lightning to come down or the or the rain to come down. And <laughs> all right, let me continue on. Uh, let me see. He's, oh, he left a note. Do you see? Did you see the note, Stephen? That uh, Neil left for you? No, I did not see. I oh, you don't see have it. it. There's a co there's a comment there. I'll, I'll I'll get to it after we're done here. It says um. Verse 35, no, verse 36. Who has put wisdom in the innermost being of man or in the layers of clouds or given understanding to the mind of man or to the heavenly display? Who can count the clouds by earthly wisdom or pour out the water jars of the heavens when the dust hardens into a mass and the clods stick together because of the heat? Can you, Job, hunt the prey for the lion? or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? Uh, when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in their lair, who provides prey for the raven when its young cry to God and wander about without food? So there's the conclusion of the chapter. Uh, I've got your thoughts on those final verses there. I think God is just referencing his, his complete creation and his absolute knowledge over all of it. Um, I would also point out that I think that the, my, my personal opinion is that the uh, separation of the Bible, the scriptures, end of chapters, you know, this chapter and then the, this one is marked as this chapter and that, was very, I hate to say it, but I think it was poorly done. I don't think that should have been the end of this chapter. Because the next line in Job 39, uh, 1, continues this sort of thought. So why did the translators pick the 41 as the end of 38 and then just choose 39? I think it seems almost arbitrary. It, it was done as though it, somebody was editing, somebody like a literary editor and, and not somebody who was considering the Word of God. But nonetheless... Uh, it, these seem to be just statements of God's complete knowledge of his creation and, and the uh, abs and unfathomable complexity of it. 
for the, the that we would have birds and lions and whatnot to eat, and they would you know and all that sort of thing. That these were, was all decreed to be take place from the beginning because of God's the complexity and and an unsearchable genius of God's creation. I your point about the uh, chapter divisions is something that I've uh, I've talked about that many times over the years when we look at the Bible and we have to understand that the words in the Bible or the scriptures but the uh, if there's a title for the chapter or subtitles within the chapters or uh, chapter numbers and and uh, verse numbers these are all insertions by men who are translating and publishing the Bible. They, they, we should not misconstrue that as scripture, even though there are some uh, from the KJV only family that, that uh, uh, really rely a lot on kind of a, a numerology. Uh, that they, they believe that even the numbering of the chapters and verses are inspired by God. And, um, you know, I let everybody else study that out and see if you want to believe that or not. But yeah, I think that's going too far, yeah, to say such a thing as that. Definitely too far. Uh, so I, I just always caution people to, uh, one, I've been doing a lot of studies and teaching recently on early church history, uh, the uh, Christian creeds, and so on. And even though it, I think all these extra biblical things, and I consider the verse numbers, the chapter numbers, the, the, the titles, and, uh, these things are extra biblical. And, and what I rely on is I, I rely entirely on this. And uh, we shouldn't put too much weight in, uh, even though maybe we can benefit sometimes, like on the Amplified Translation, they make a title for each chapter, and they have some t subtitles within the chapters. And sometimes uh, that can give some shed some light on what the chapter is about, but sometimes people are not differentiating between the scripture and the uh, the additions that are they are just you know made by by mere men. Uh, let me get your your uh, kind of synopsis of this chapter, and I think I read the next verse too, and I think you're right that the next verse is connected. The, in fact, the, the tirade uh, of uh, of, uh, of God uh, uh, and Job here is uh, continues on in the next chapter, but uh, let me get you just a synopsis of this whole chapter and then before we close. Yeah, I, I guess I, the, the chapter is obviously two things to me. Uh, it is God's uh, querying Job to show him that uh, God knows all things, and, and Job is merely a man, and he, the, the answers for all of Job's questions about why this and why that are beyond his scope, and if he would put his faith in God, in trust in God, that God has ample reason for all that he does, a justifiable cause, then that is where the truth lies. It, it is also an astonishing book full of scientific foreknowledge about this earth, that man could not possibly have known. And I, I could have gone on much, much more in depth about some of the things I've shown you photographs and whatnot that demonstrate that the features of this earth described in the Bible there in this in this book are exactly what the, the scriptures are describing. It's it's phenomenal. Absolutely. Th this passage, uh, the book, describes uh, rolled mountains, that God rolled the mountains in his anger, and that's exactly what we see when we look at photographs of the earth. The mountains are rolled. So uh, I, I think it's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a book given to us for all time, that, like all the rest of the books, but if, it seems to really cut to the chase for someone who really follows creation science. Yeah, just a very, you know, I know that Job has already been being rebuked by, you know, his three friends, you know, and by Elihu, but now, you know, God himself even shows up. Even though, you know, Jacob was righteous, but just showing, you know, the difference between, you know, man and God. You know, just man and God in general. Even the most righteous man is still small, you know, in comparison to God. 
and just going into detail on you know all of these you know geological, astronomical, you know, and like physical, like you know, physics facts that wouldn't even be discovered, you know, for you know hundreds or thousands of years, you know, after this. So it's just showing you know, not only is the Bible, you know, the Word of God, and not only is it you know accurate on science, but I mean, just the fact that, you know, that knowledge is just there, you know, it's just you know, it's incredible. You know, so overall, this is just an amazing, you know, chapter. You know, just looking at this big rebuke, and you know, as it continues on in the next chapter. Yeah, there, there's there's so much to be learned from from Job. It's uh, to me, it's one of my most enjoyable studies, um, and uh, I've been convinced that that God was correct in choosing Job, of all the people in the world to be kind of a delegate of mankind for Satan to examine and uh, he truly was maybe the best of mankind had to offer uh, and yet we can see that God is is uh, uh, kind of rebuking him too because he, Job even in his goodness and righteousness he, he's not perfect and that leads us right into uh, the, the message of salvation the gospel and the, the word gospel is a Greek word. It means good news. <laughs> so, so we're going to tell you some good news right now, and we'll keep it very brief because salvation really is very simple, and it shouldn't take long to explain it. But the good news basically is that uh, even though man is a sinner and imperfect and therefore disqualified from being with God because we've all sinned, uh, we all, the scripture says, we all fall short of the glory of God. The, the glory of God would be perfection. That's the standard we have to meet if we want to be with God in heaven forever. And But we all fall short. So even Job falls short. And uh, so what are we to, to do? The uh, uh, Bible says that the good news is that Jesus Christ is offering salvation and eternal life in heaven to all of us. No exceptions. It's offered to all people, and it's offered as, as a free gift. Uh, you don't have to join a religion and become a religious person or follow a set of religious rules, and, and um, you don't have to uh, change your life and, and attend church. All of these things, you know, we, we would advise you these are good things to do, but these are not the means of salvation. The only thing that's required of us to receive salvation as a free gift from God is to put our faith in Jesus instead of believing that somehow we can accomplish that on our own through our own efforts. So the gospel is the good news that salvation is offered as a free gift to all of us and we receive it when we put our faith completely in Jesus rather than our own merit, our own righteousness, our own efforts, our, our, our religious efforts. Uh, let me allow a, a, a minute or two for each one of you to make any comments on that, and then we'll, we'll close for the night. Go ahead. Uh, Jesus Christ is certainly the truth, the life, and the way. Uh, w without him, we have no hope. Uh, he was God is gracious enough that he became flesh and took our place on the cross. Without him, we have no hope. Uh, this is the character of our God. He is good. He is loving and graceful. That he was willing to do what no man on this earth would do for us all. And uh, we, we owe him our lives. As it said, you know, in Matthew, you know, 18, 11, for the Son of Man has come to save, you know, that which is lost. You know, it's just amazing, you know, thinking, you know, especially about the context which we saw here in Job. You know, and the fact that Jesus was just willing to, you know, you know, the eternal God of this universe, God's perfect Son, coming here in the form of a flesh, when after He had done all that, and He doesn't have to, but He still, you know, came here, died, was buried, and rose again, and was still pleasing to the Father, you know, and did everything that we couldn't do, you know, and just being willing to offer us, you know, the gift of eternal life just for believing on Him, as it said, you know, in John six forty seven. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Well, the best part of the gospel, you know, that we, uh, well, at least to me, is, of course, the concept, you know, of eternal security that we have in Jesus. 
You know, as it says in John 10, 28, you know, and I give up, this is Jesus talking, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall all men pluck them out of my hand. So, you know, just for believing, you know, as Jesus said, all we have to do is just have faith in him. There's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can factor, another, no other belief. You know, as Evan mentioned, as Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man will come to the Father but by me. It's only through Jesus that we have eternal life. So just by coming to him and believing on him, you have everlasting life and you have it forever. And that's the amazing, you know, part of the gospel. And that's the invitation I offer to every one of you, is just to come to Jesus and live. Amen. Christ offers paradise, he says. All right, so uh, it's... Uh, it, it's sim simply, this could be illustrated from this icon of I have here. Uh, Jesus wants to get take you to heaven. He, he's Bible says he does not desire that any of us should perish. So rather than putting faith in your own ability to get there, reject that and instead put your faith in not what you did, but what Jesus did for you. And he, what he did was... He's God, yet he became a man, and he died on a cross and paid for our sins, and he raised himself from the dead after three days to prove that his claims were true. He's God, he's Savior, and he does offer us eternal life as a free gift if we'll trust him. And this verse that Brother Stephen cited there, he says, I have you in the palm of my hand, and no one can pluck you out. If you put your faith in him, he embraces you, and he will never let go no matter what. You never have to worry about losing your salvation because um, he promises he will never let you go, never leave you or forsake you. And because it's a promise from God, it's a guarantee. So as for me, uh, I am guaranteed I'm going to heaven not because of anything I've done, but because of what Jesus did for me. All right, brothers, thank you for participating tonight. Uh, this was, uh, I'm used to doing these hour broadcasts. Now, I used to do them all for two hours or more. And I now, for the last few months, have been doing them nightly for an hour. <laughs> I'm not used to going for almost two hours, but I really enjoyed it. And uh, Brother Stephen, it's nice to see you again. And Brother Evan, uh, I'm glad you could find time you're scheduled to join us for chapter 38. I was really looking forward to it. All right, I'll give you any final good remarks, and then we'll say good night. I just want to thank you for inviting me, brother. It's a blessing. God bless you for what you're doing. Your, your, your monumental effort of going through the Bible chapter by chapter, book by book. I've never seen anybody do this. I mean, it's just amazing what you're doing. I think it's wonderful. And I praise God for you, and I thank you, and and uh, I, I'm blessed to be a part of it in the smallest way. I agree, definitely, with everything that Evan just said. It was awesome to be able to be here in fellowship every night, you know, and to learn. But, you know, especially just being able to relate all this to you into the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ, and just to be able to spread it every night. You know, I look forward to that, you know, every day that I can make it here, so... You know, I think it's just amazing to be able to do this. I just, I don't plan to stop anytime soon. I just want to keep doing this. All right. Thank you for participating. And um, please, uh, viewers, uh, join, join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ. <laughs>